Well, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Matt Piper. I'm the Global Director for Industry Solutions for Utilities and AEC at Esri. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for the first webinar of the ArcGIS Utility Network webinar series. This webinar is on the seven steps to getting started with the ArcGIS Utility Network. The second webinar will be on the 22nd of July and will focus on the business value of the ArcGIS Utility Network. This webinar will focus on applications of the utility network into business workflows to create business value, but also highlight some of the new capabilities that this technology unlocks. And finally, on August 5th, we'll wrap up the series with a webinar on migration and implementation of the utility network. Now, as you all have already registered for this webinar, you are automatically registered for the entire series. And a reminder email will be sent closer to the day for the next webinars. In addition, at the end of this series, you'll receive an access to the recordings and links to numerous other content. We have over 1,800 people registered today. And as a result, we want to ensure that any questions you have are answered. In the middle of the screen, there's a chat option. Please write any questions you have as we go along and we'll get you, on, on, we'll get you responses as soon as we can, either during this webinar or as a follow-up email following the webinar. As I mentioned earlier, this webinar is also being recorded and the recordings will be made available following this series. Now, I've already introduced myself, but I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our other two speakers today. We're fortunate to be joined by Chris Capelli, who is an executive consultant for the utilities team. And he has invested a lot of time in developing content and a framework which helps utilities understand and get started with the utility network. And I'd also like to introduce John Long, who is a senior consultant on the Esri Utilities Professional Services team. And he has also taken the lead on many implementations of the utility network through, for many customers throughout the globe. Now we have about 45 minutes with you today. And looking at today's agenda, um, we're gonna take you through a high level overview of what we're seeing in the market and the progress of some of our customers. Chris and John will then take us through a deeper dive on what is the utility network, how to chart your course, and then set up a pilot or proof of concept. And finally, we'll wrap up the webinar with a recap and a look at what's next for your industry. Now, having worked in the industry for over 20 years, for me, this is very interesting, challenging, and yet a very exciting time. Now, this is an industry that traditionally has been very slow to change, but now it's facing significant challenges. These challenges are now accelerating a utility's need for modern solutions. These solutions need to manage both the traditional network, but also the challenges of managing a modern network. And these challenges include things like decentralization, electrification, energy transition, and of course, the changing customer demands. Now it is for this reason that Esri has made such a significant investment in developing the ArcGIS utility network. It is purposely built to help utilities across the electric, gas, water, and telecom industries. It is purposely built to not just do what a traditional GIS does, but it redefines what a GIS is within a modern organization. The utility network is the enabling technology to unlock the capabilities of a modern complete GIS platform, which uses the power of location to digitally transform your organization and the way utilities do work. Now at a global scale, there is significant momentum in the adoption of the ArcGIS Utility Network. We're very excited and very proud of the work that has happened. Utilities are rapidly moving their project deployments from planning to pilots and into implementation at an accelerated and exponential rate. Following the initial early adopters, there are now over 10 organizations across the globe that are live on the Utility Network. And as per our latest analysis indicates, and as shown on this map, there are actually over 200 organizations across the globe with projects that are now in progress to deployment. The geometric network with ArcMap has served utilities very well for the past 20 years. However, with the advancements in other enterprise technologies, a modern GIS is quickly becoming the cornerstone to manage a modern network. Now we have over 1,800 people registered, as I said, for this webinar. And as we're doing it live, we want to keep it as interactive as possible. And we want to understand how we can help you better. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're very fortunate to have one of our senior consultants with us, John Long, who has worked closely with many organizations on their utility network projects. 
So I'm going to pass it over to John now to take us into the first poll. So welcome, John. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. My name is John Long. I'm a senior consultant and project manager for utility professional services at Esri. And I'm basically the poll watcher today. I'm excited about today's webinar because for many of you, this webinar should help you get started and chart the course to your utility network implementation. While I have had the opportunity to work on several utility network projects already, what I have seen is that the biggest hurdle is often the first one. So our first poll focuses on your blockers. So what we'd like to know is what is your biggest impediment for adopting ArcGIS with the utility network? Is it time and resources, executive support, in other words, you don't have the support or, or you don't have the budget. Completeness and quality of your data. System integrations and or you know, legacy system dependencies. Or the good placeholder of other. And as Matt mentioned, we really want to see active participation in these polls. So please use this opportunity to stay engaged and participate in, in each of the polls. All right, the results are in. We've got, um, I guess, a pretty uh, interesting distribution here. Uh, most of the challenges seem to be around system integrations and or legacy system dependencies. The other big one, uh, actually tied for second, is time and resources and completeness and quality of your data. While each of these you know, represent their own independent challenges, I'm gonna just touch base on a couple of them. So in regards to system integrations you know, or the legacy system, dependencies. This one is actually one of the most challenging impediments to get past. However, partners and vendors of key business systems are embracing the utility network and integrations are being defined, developed, and implemented. Additionally, functions such as export subnetwork provide a commercially viable way to provide your utility data, your connectivity model, even to legacy systems by providing a JSON export that can be parsed to any desired format that your legacy system could then you know, ingest. As far as time and resources go, while this is always a challenge, start with goals that are achievable and plot your course. By defining a plan, you can prioritize accordingly <clears throat> and approach the implementation methodically. Remember, failing to plan is planning to fail. And then last but not least, completeness and quality of your data. Don't feel alone, there's, there's not a utility or pipeline company out there that has perfect data. Well, the best approach is to address data quality and complete, completeness issues up front. It helps mitigate the, the challenges that you might experience during your migration. However, many of these data issues can be resolved programmatically with tools or scripts during your implementation. So don't let that be a blocker. Now, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Chris Capelli, who's going to prime your utility network fundamental knowledge to set the stage for the rest of this presentation. Chris? Hey, thanks a lot, John. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. You know, as, as Matt said earlier, you know, GIS is an essential system of the modern utility. Uh, and as John highlighted, I mean, we all face challenges. In my new role at Esri, I've had the opportunity to, to work with executives, uh, and GIS managers alike to really understand what are some of the challenges uh, that they've faced in the past and then bridge that to what our newest uh, technology is able to deliver. And I think there's some interesting uh, intersections there and that's what between myself and John will cover through the rest of the webinar. So obviously your geospatial data is now an indispensable corporate asset. I, I think there's universal acknowledgement throughout your organization, probably, um, that those uh, representations of your assets and network are vital to how people do their, their work in the field and in the office. And, you know, I think there's some essential things that now ArcGIS does specifically to support the modern asset and network management workflows. So as you all know, I mean, ArcGIS uh, is a comprehensive platform. It includes advanced network modeling capabilities, that thing that we typically call the utility network now. Uh, obviously, visualization and embedded analytics is a key strength of ArcGIS, as well as providing secure, pervasive access and collaboration tools 
that enable people in your organization to use and consume that information to make better, more informed decisions. And I think, as you all know, I mean, I, I know most of you have deployed ArcGIS and have had it running in, in many cases for, for over a decade. It provides a comprehensive and extensible platform that you can use to connect in and probably have used to connect to other systems. So at the heart uh, of this whole conversation is the notion, as Matt said perfectly, that RTS provides that complete platform for the modern utility. Now, this utility network uh, is, is something I wanted to dive into a bit right now. And the way I kind of think about it is the utility network is a capability of the RTS platform. It's not a separate thing, it's, it's part of. Let me walk you through five kind of aspects of the utility network and ArcGIS. So first, when together, they provide a comprehensive framework for modeling utility assets and networks. You, Matt said it uh, earlier, and I'll just reiterate, the utility network information model itself was purpose-built for utilities. With ArcGIS and the utility network, you can encapsulate your business rules and business logic to ensure the security, accuracy, and consistency of your geospatial data. And that's something that John and I are gonna talk about more and more as we progress through this, this presentation. Now, the utility network itself, well, it's comprised of a data type within the geodatabase. Both the file and the enterprise geodatabases have it. And it's exposed as RESTful services with ArcGIS Enterprise. Now, obviously, the file geodatabase is used for single user environments where it's just a person on a, on a desktop uh, maintaining a network or used in piloting um, your efforts. And when you move into production or a larger organization, you would use the enterprise geodatabase and expose that through RESTful services. And again, we'll talk more about that. It enables you to depict a network as both a map and a diagram. Now, this is one of the inherent things now with, the, with ArcGIS and Utility Network. The network itself, you know, your data in the network at any point can be dynamically displayed as a map and as a diagram. And switching back and forth is seamless. I think that's something that's obviously essential for most operational uh, needs. And then last but not least, it's tightly coupled with other core capabilities of the ArcGIS platform, such as attribute rules, contingent values, editor tracking and branch versioning, and so on. And we'll get into more details about that. But this is just a general overview to put the utility network into perspective as part of the ArcGIS platform. So now let me kind of quickly move around uh, this. Um, maybe the best way to think about the utility network information model itself is to really understand um, what it's comprised of. Now Matt said it before, again, it was purposely built for utilities. So it's not a general purpose information model like points and lines and polygons. It is actually specific to the needs of utilities. It is meant for assets and networks. So I'm gonna start at the top and go around clockwise. So right at the top, you see structure networks. And those are the things that contain or hold your assets and network features, such as poles and vaults and trenches. Uh, the main networks are features that represent your networks and how your resources flow through them. And it's probably worth mentioning that the utility network can contain more than one domain network, which I think is an important characteristic if you're a, a joint use uh, provider. Next are network tiers, and those organize subnetworks into logical groupings uh, within a domain network. You know, for example, you could use tiers to define which features in your network are part of transmission or subtransmission or distribution systems. Uh, next is the subnetworks, and those represent topological sections of your domain network, um, such as pressure zones and gas and water, and circuits and electric. Asset groups and asset types provide the ability to model the major and minor classifications of the features in your, your network. Device terminals are logical connection points. Uh, terminals control how features connect and define the valid pathways across your network. And then, uh, of course, there's trace analytics, which enable you to analyze the logical pathways and determine the flow of commodities through your network. And of course, last but not least, are diagrams a powerful, some symbolic representation of your network. And as I mentioned before, 
both maps and diagrams are dynamic views of that same underlying data. You know, it bears repeating, this was a purpose-built information model. It's actually the result of significant R&D uh, and based on a lot of feedback from utilities all over the world. So it is something to, to really understand because it's so powerful and has the ability to change the way that you approach your work. Now, as I said before, the utility network information model works in concert with other key capabilities of ArcGIS. So the two specific capabilities I just wanted to highlight here were attribute rules and arcade expressions. Attribute rules enable you to define the rules and logic that are gonna help ensure the consistency and the completeness of your tabular data. Now you can think about these rules as sometimes streamlining data entry and virtually eliminating data entry errors, which I think is actually really important uh, and can save those key clicks. Arcade, well, that's, uh, that's ArcGIS's built-in expression language. It enables you to define and perform mathematical calculations, manipulate text, and evaluate logical statements. It's a very powerful and versatile way to set up the rules and define your business logic. Now, there are some really great resources. Actually, there's a number of great resources available for you on this, and I just highlighted two of these here. Obviously, there's the blogs, uh, the ArcGIS blogs. So you probably know already where they are, um, but I'm gonna provide a link uh, after, after this as well, where you can find uh, uh, several articles, really practical articles that detail how to use these four utilities. And of course, there's the technical details about the expression language itself. So again, you know, in my experience, many organizations are already leveraging both of these. So combining that knowledge you already have with the utility network information model to define the rules that govern your apps and integrations, editing behaviors, well, that's, that's you're already part of the way there. And I think that's gonna be significant in terms of your ability to overcome some of those objections we talked about before. All right, now let me switch gears just a little bit and, and in a way back up. You've seen this diagram before. Um, you know, at the core of ArcGIS is a services-based architecture. And you know, with that architecture comes several inherent benefits, including greater scalability and performance, enabling more robust integrations with other systems, and supporting both on-premise and cloud computing infrastructures. And I think you know, those are essential characteristics that frankly are necessary to support the information technology needs of the modern utility. So now let me go ahead and direct your attention to those padlocks. Your geospatial data is secure within ArcGIS because all apps and developer SDKs use those secure REST APIs. ArcGIS Pro uses them, as do Collector, Operations Dashboard, and the other ArcGIS apps for Office and Field. When it comes to integrating with other systems, it is a best practice to use those same REST APIs because doing so is going to safeguard the security and integrity of your geospatial data. Now, I wanna go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into this topic of security and data integrity. So first, information security. Obviously, it's a pretty important topic these days and well into the future because we want to make sure that our systems are secure. And ArcGIS provides your system administrators, as I think most of you already know, with a very comprehensive set of fine-grained information security controls. And those controls are gonna govern completely the access to your geospatial data and system capabilities. Now it starts here at the top with user accounts, which establish the identity of each person you authorize to use your system. Then it goes down to user types, which define kind of the broader set of privileges that somebody can have user roles, which gets very specific about the rights to assign to a user. Group permissions, I kind of think are interesting because you know, many of you are already using groups probably to mimic your organization's structure, maybe having groups by a department or team, but groups can also be used to enable cross-cutting initiatives where collaboration and data sharing is essential. And I think that's, 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 a, that's a really powerful capability because using and consuming that information is actually what this is really all about. And then last but not least, of course, everything in ArcGIS has an item level permission. So with those cascading controls, ArcGIS gives you complete control 
over which uh, you know, individuals can view and see different kinds of data and certainly who can edit and who can't edit the data. I think the, just the bottom line is your asset and network data are definitely secure inside of, uh, inside of ArcGIS. Now, let's move on to the other side of that. And that's really um, about um, encapsulating your business rules and logic into those secure REST APIs. And the reason you're doing that is to ensure that your asset and networks are, uh, have high quality and consistency. So let's cover these five kind of capabilities. Oops, sorry. Let's cover these five kind of capabilities uh, and really talk more about how the utility network and network rules fit into all this. So I bet you probably stopped right there in the center with network rules because obviously those are really important. Those rules dictate which features can connect or associate with other features. Uh, those are obviously gonna be essential for defining the connectivity and valid pathways within your networks. Attribute rules and contingent values provide logic to constrain, validate, and calculate data. And with those rules, you can likely eliminate all your data entry errors. Um, using those rules can also save your end users a bunch of key clicks. I mentioned that before, but it bears mentioning again because it makes it easier for your end user to navigate the system by not having to offer up certain choices for them to make because you can automatically calculate them or certainly validate whatever they're entering. Editor tracking provides a sort of digital fingerprinting. Um, so you, know, as you probably know ArcGIS automatically captures the user's identity and date and time of any any time a data uh, data is added or changed or updated. And then using standard query and reporting functions, you can interrogate that and see the lineage and history of your data. And I know that's really important for many of your compliance workflows. And of course, you know, all those capabilities work in concert with the other geodata-based functionality, such as fields and default values and so on. So now let me pause here for a second because I cover two really important things. I mean, with ArcGIS, you have secure uh, RESTful services. And inside those RESTful services is this business logic. And that's a rather important point. And it's probably one of the biggest fundamental differences uh, between what you had and, and what you will have by implementing ArcGIS with the utility network. So let me try to bring that set of topics together. Uh, it's important to understand uh, where the business rules reside has significant consequences on information security, data consistency, and ultimately on your total cost of ownership. So I figured let's try using a comparison to, to evaluate the differences. So if you look on the left, the client server architecture, which you know, pretty much everybody used in the past, provided a great foundation in its time. It enabled apps to connect directly to the database uh, and it served us well, I mean, for many years. Um, I think where the challenges started to come in is you know, it worked really well for a small number of apps because at the heart of it, you had to maintain your rules and logic in each of those apps. And in some cases, you know, as the number of apps increased, it could be rather challenging and cost prohibitive to replicate those rules across your apps consistently. So now look to the right. And I think this is where it gets fairly interesting. The contemporary services-oriented architecture of ArcGIS is gonna offer you obviously a lot of technical and business advantages, you know, but stay focused on where those rules are and you see the difference. The rules are now at the services level and they apply to all the clients and integrations. That means all edits, every edit performed from ArcGIS Pro or those done from web browsers or done from mobile apps, all follow your rules. And I think that's, a, that's an important difference. Before, you didn't really have that capability. Now, you have it. And that's going to enable you to open up some pretty substantial changes in how you think about allowing people to edit or consume your data and probably start to tackle some of those integration issues that you raised because you're going to write a rule once and that rule is going to apply to, to everything. And I think that's ultimately going to increase the security, quality, consistency, and completeness of your data. And frankly, it's going to make it probably cheaper to maintain longer term. Um, and, you know, I, I hesitate to say it, but it's going to also prevent the, the accumulation of significant technical debt. Uh, you know, sometimes bespoke applications that have their own proprietary rule base 
bring into your, your, your environment. So I thought now would be kind of a good time. John, I know we have two more questions, so back to you. Excellent, thank you, Chris. I uh, appreciate you uh, priming our attendees' uh, fundamental knowledge of the utility network. All right, y'all, as Chris mentioned, I'm back with a two-part poll this time. So let's start with the first poll. What stage best describes your effort to adopt ArcGIS with the utility network? You haven't started yet. You're at the planning stage, and that can be with internal staff or consultants. You're developing a POC and or prototype, or even a pilot. You're at a production implementation phase or you're actually live in production. Excellent, well, uh, looks like uh, the majority of you are at the have not started phase yet. Uh, hopefully after seeing this webinar, you're inspired to at least set up a personal sandbox environment to build your personal knowledge and understanding to prep for your project uh, and start you know, planning for your project. Uh, for those that are in the planning stage, um, I, I'm very encouraged to see the, that we have that many out there that are in that stage. Uh, it really looks like people have embraced the vision uh, that uh, Chris, you know, kind of uh, outlined earlier in, in our, you know, understanding that the business value is there, uh, you know, for the utility network framework. Um, so with that, I'd like to step into the next poll. Poll two of our two-part poll, what is your expected go-live date in production with ArcGIS and the utility network? Is it undetermined, less than six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 24 months, or greater than 24 months? All right, we're gonna close the poll so we can see the results. Very interesting. All right, so the majority of you are at the undetermined stage. So, and that is closely followed by the 12 to 24, and also the uh, you know, greater than 24 months. So for those of you uh, with a target go live date of 12 months or greater, or even you know undetermined, uh, Chris is going to help you uh, with charting a course uh, for your implementation. Even if you're deep into your production implementation, I think you're going to find that the information that he provides insightful uh, to your future implementation, uh, implementation and enhancement efforts. So Chris, back to you. All right, thanks, John. Well, uh, so thanks to everybody who's uh, submitting their answers to these polls. The information is really useful to look at because it confirms you know, uh, really the reasons why Matt and John and I put this presentation together for you. Because you know, sometimes adopting new technology, finding the time to do it, the budget, all those things kind of build together and can seem overwhelming. If you've frankly set any personal goals, you probably experience the same thing. Something needs to stimulate you. So that's really where John and I wanted to take the, the rest of this presentation and help you chart a course. So here's, here's one of the reasons why you probably came. Seven steps to help you start your own personal POC, or as John called it, sandbox. And I think it's really rather important to maybe poke some of those uh, misperceptions that existed or um, help overcome some of the, the challenges associated with learning a new technology. So that's what this document's really about. And we're going to send this out to everybody that's actually registered for this webinar. And on the left side are those seven steps, modeling your net, understanding modeling networks, more of the kind of primer on WebGIS, so you have more of the background on, on that, both kind of conceptually and then technical details. Setting up your POC environment, because frankly, you can get started in about an hour. Um, that POC environment that we're talking about here actually could get started with just a copy of ArcGIS Pro uh, and uh, the foundation templates that are available uh, from the Esri site. Those foundation templates are actually a really important way to accelerate your efforts, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. And then obviously kicking the tires and running through some workflow trials using that sample data and the rule base that's provided in it. I think that's an important way to really learn the, the technology. 
And frankly, this is, this is how I went about um, learning the technology after transitioning into this role. Um, most of you, if not all of you, are really interested in network tracing. So being able to understand the different tracing analytic options and parameters that you can utilize, and then also how those uh, work with the data. And that probably will help you structuring your data and come up with your final design. And then last but not least, really diving into that business logic and setting up the rules. So that's the left side of that diagram. And on the right side are direct links to specific resources, videos, documentation, blogs, uh, and the foundation templates themselves that are, we really kind of uh, curated a, a fine list for you here to help it make it even easier to find the right materials to just get you started. So again, in my experience in less than an hour, uh, I had a, had this same thing up and running on my PC uh, with a copy of ArcGIS Pro just using a, a file geodatabase. So um, I hope this encourages you to kind of jumpstart to kick the tires at least. Now, if you don't already have Pro, there's you know a few ways you can obviously get it uh, through your organization. You could also go on site and or on our esri.com website and and request an evaluation. We can, frankly, if this is a part of your professional learning uh, adventure, you could uh, get the, the personal use uh, version of ArcGIS uh, for $100 a year. So hopefully we've made it easy to get started. Now I mentioned this before, and I, I just wanna highlight these again because these foundation templates are actually quite important because I think, you know, my, my sense at least, and then talking to many utilities actually big and small alike, these provide a great baseline to really jumpstart your, your work. And I think, frankly, a lot of people will just use these templates as is. Others will make some minor changes and others will you know, use it as a, a launch point to make more significant changes so that the system kind of models how they, their organization works. Now those templates include documentation, the database schema itself, attribute rules, network rules, all the things that I covered before, uh, they include a pro project and, and uh, sample data and a data loading tool. So when you're ready, uh, you can obviously load your own data into the rule set you've created and, and go to the next step. Uh, so again, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at these, boy, I would, I would urge you to, to do so. Which brings us probably to the next logical poll, John. Excellent, thank you, Chris. So as Chris just highlighted, the ways, um, the ways that the uh, Esri Foundation templates can accelerate your understanding and, and reduce your time to value, uh, I'm really excited about this next poll because um, as an implementer, I've seen the, uh, the value that these templates bring uh, to actually uh, reduce time to value and expedite implementations. Uh, so with that, let's open up the next poll. Do you plan to, or did you use, a foundation template? Yes, no, undecided, or you weren't aware that the foundational templates were available. As I mentioned, I'm really anxious to see these results, so let's move on to take a look. Excellent, all right, well, um, I, I see a good number of you have actually uh, either plan to or are using those foundational templates, but the majority of you are not aware of those foundational templates. Um, so for those that you that basically chose another option other than yes, I think you're gonna find that the efforts that have gone into building out these foundational templates will greatly accelerate your project configuration uh, and you're gonna get quicker returns uh, on your investment. Uh, so with that, I think, uh, Chris, let's take it back to you. Yeah, John, I'm, now I'm even uh, more happy that we highlighted those, those templates so everybody could uh, go explore them. Now, John, as you know, I'll tell you, one of the things I've noticed, uh, even within our own conversations, sometimes we use uh, terms interchangeably and um, it just happens. So what I thought we could do is maybe just lay out a common set of vernacular uh, for how we think about, you know, these these projects, you know, so it's all about business transformation in the end, I'm understanding the people, the process, and the technology to help people use technology as a tool to make their 
their, their work tasks easier, more efficient, or even do things that they couldn't do before. So, you know, for me, there's the proof of concept, and sometimes these are very, you know, lightweight uh, efforts, maybe involving one or two or, or a few people. Uh, they probably are, you know, either a combination of a learning exercise, like we just went over with those seven steps, uh, personal POC, that really kind of amplifies and, and focuses your attention on learning key capabilities of a specific aspect of the system. Um, or they could be, you know, uh, more, more specific uh, to really tackle a specific kind of workflow uh, using a technology. I think sometimes, you know, those are just a, a good learning experience and they don't really progress. But I think most times they contribute to what I would call prototypes. And prototypes are really where you're starting to pull together many concepts, uh, really starting to model a system in its truest sense, the people, the process, and the technology, uh, so that you can really understand how those work together to, to satisfy end user needs and also fit into your organizational uh, constraints and, and, and characteristics. And then obviously pilot has a has special meaning. Pilot for most organizations is that it's kind of limited production rollout where you're maybe got a, a small portion of your, your service territory that you've automated with the new system and new processes and you're using it to really kind of burn in the system to make sure that it's ready to be turned on for your full organization. Of course, production. John, is that kind of how you see it too? Yeah, most definitely. And, you know, much like you, I, I also see that, uh, you know, the people kind of mix those terms and concepts. So it's good to at least level set the stage, um, you know, having worked with utilities, you know, we, we all tend to call things uh, different things. So, you know, having a good fundamental understanding of those stages really helps set the course of really getting to that business transformation that you mentioned, Chris. Yeah, I think the you know, last point is, you know, this doesn't may seem a little bit too structured or, or too, uh, too um, theoretical. My sense is that, you know, the time frame, some people just move through these stages here very fast for certain efforts and others take, you know, more effort and, and, and more time. So, you know, you, just like your, your, your automobile or your bicycle, your mileage may vary. <laughs> Agreed. And, and you can enter in at, at different stages, right? You, you don't yeah. have to start at proof of concept, then prototype, then pilot. You, you could come in directly at prototype and move to pilot, you know, so uh, it's definitely good stuff, Chris. All right, John. So here's your next poll. Excellent. All right. So, uh, you know, our uh, fifth poll of the day uh, and also the final poll of the day. Uh, we want to understand a few, just a pretty simple one. So uh, let's launch the poll. Have you set up a personal POC with ArcGIS Pro and a file geo database on your own personal computer? We're keeping this you know, uh, poll pretty binary. The answer is either yes or no. So Chris, I know you're ready to see the results on this one, but I'm, I'm gonna give <laughs> everyone a, a you know, a little bit longer to, to help build your anticipation. All right, Joe, let's go ahead and close the poll. All right, well, uh, you know, you know, almost to be expected, the majority of, uh, you know, our uh, audience base has not set up a personal POC with ArcGIS Pro and a file geo database. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think it, it just kind of, uh, you know, hits the fact that uh, this, this uh, webinar uh, will help inspire you uh, to, to really take the plunge into setting up your own personal POC. Uh, with ArcGIS Pro 2.5, the utility network is now supported on a file geo database. Uh, and it really opens the door for building your understanding of, of the utility network because you can easily take those foundational solutions uh, that uh, Chris mentioned and, and set something up to help build your understanding uh, that way you're better prepared for your implementation. Uh, um, so with that, in the interest of time, I'm going to send it back to Chris. All right, <laughs> John. So here, John and I just tried to put together a, a potential way to maybe think about uh, progressing through these stages. So obviously that POC1 is, is that seven-step methodology we, we outlined before. And, you know, 
you know, time estimates are, are below and, and, and will vary from organization to organization. Uh, so POC2, you know, maybe applying the knowledge you gained in POC1 using that sample data with your own data, and then really starting to understand and, and tweak the rule base to meet how you connect your network features and how you want to represent uh, your assets uh, and create your structures and, and so on. POC3 could be, you know, something like taking it to ArcGIS Enterprise and connecting it to your Active Directory, um, creating the feature of map services, uh, setting up your groups. And now I almost hesitated to put this one on here, John, because I know most of the folks here probably have ArcGIS Enterprise already set up. So it would really just be, you know, connecting, connecting the two. And then, you know, prototype one, focusing in on, you know, uh, an effort to really go through those, the transformation side of this, the people in the process to really make sure this is fitting to your end user's needs, generating information products it needs to, uh, and, and helping you save those key clicks and, and time that you want. And, you know, moving on from there. John, anything? Um, I'm actually glad you put that in there, Chris, because really uh, the nice thing about uh, the support of the utility network on a file geodatabase is it allows you to really actively do things uh, more efficiently and quickly to to validate your, your POC uh, and, and get greater understanding uh, because you don't have the additional administrative overhead uh, of, you know, turning around and publishing those services. So, so I, I really like this slide, Chris. Good. All right, well, that takes us to our next one. And, you know, um, everybody's going to get the slides, uh, so you don't need to, to read too far into this. But I think the point that John and I wanted to make was, you know, sometimes it can seem daunting to move data. And, you know, what we've realized from, from working uh, with organizations over many years is these are, these, are, these are an opportunity to automate some of the paper workflows and paper data that still exists in organizations. So we laid out, you know, a, a, a logical, repeatable, and fairly efficient process here to help you kind of create that sketch of how to move and automate data into uh, your, your prototype environment, combining maybe CAD information with existing GIS information that comes from ArcGIS or another system, and you know, automating paper, working to refine the rules, uh, and, and so on. John? No, I, I, this really outlines the process really well, Chris. Um, it, it really kind of uh, you know brings you into to really once you're at that uh, stage of building out your POC, how you actually get that data uh, into your utility network, uh, and, and it really kind of defines that. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, migration tools out there uh, that we'll talk in about in a later um, uh, session, the third session actually. Um, that that will really help you kind of get to this point, but uh, you know, th this is a really kind of a clean way of uh, of uh, outlining really the end-to-end -end process. Yeah, I, I think John, you just gave yourself a plug for that third webinar, which I thought was really kind of clever. But I would I would I would urge everybody to actually participate in that one as well. You're going to hear some pretty deep insights from a person who is leading a majority of the projects. Uh, that Esri is actually helping with. Um, and I think the key for me is, you know, it does not have to be expensive or complex to move information into this utility network or to, you know, set these rules. Frankly, I think it's going to provide you a great opportunity to profile your data and understand those errors, really understand those errors that many of you said were, were one of your concerns. Because uh, in our real experience, you know, most errors that people encounter can actually be uh, resolved using automated um, calculations, uh, and very few percent of, percentage wise, you know, really need human intervention. So I wouldn't let you. I wouldn't allow. I really don't. Don't don't make that a perception that keeps you from moving forward with testing this out. You're not only going to know uh, the quality of your data until you put this put this into practice. So the the Next thing we typically run counter is this idea of the level of detail. And obviously in moving uh, to this new utility network information model, you have the opportunity to have what you have now. Frankly, you know, some of the people that have already moved in or are actually piloting right now took exactly the representations they had currently 
and moved them into the utility network and just added the rules uh, to make sure their data integrity was actually far better than it was in the past. Um, so that's, that's definitely valid. Others have actually looked at this as a big opportunity and married it with a transformation exercise and are adding more details, such as those terminals that I mentioned before to enable better tracing. And I think this is all gonna be about the business case um, and whether you need these additional capabilities and, and level of detail or you just good where you got what you got. John? Yeah, this is really good stuff. I, I mean, essentially a lot of folks, their hang up has always been the quote unquote fidelity of you know their their target model so really what you've outlined here is 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 yes you can take it to, to kind of a um, you know the same state um, that, that you're currently in but what i'm seeing is a lot of people are actually using this opportunity to enhance their model uh, with greater fidelity uh, and you know in particular um, you know water utilities um, you know water utilities <laughs> you know, traditionally haven't kept up with a lot of their, their fittings, uh, but uh, often uh, their biggest points of failure is at the fitting. So having more detail about those fittings uh, can help our utilities better proactively address those challenges in the future. Yeah, John, you, that's spot on. I mean, uh, in working with utilities uh, in Europe, I've found that there's this real, real desire to use GIS as their asset registry, you know, as that system of record um, not just for the network, but actually um, as that authoritative asset registry. And exactly as you said, modeling the fit and fittings uh, becomes something that is uh, is now within reach. So I think that provides some really great opportunities for people to look at. But again, you know, try that first POC uh, to really understand, you know, the differences between what you have and and potentially where you want to go. That way you can you know, really dial in this decision point because it need not be a, a complex or scary or expensive uh, undertaking for sure. Um, the one last thing I thought we should cover is kind of the common editing workflows. You know, historically, you know, there's there's been a few and I'll just bring them up on, on screen so everybody can see them. And, you know, one of the things that ArcGIS, now that it's a, a, a based on a secure set of services, uh, that's service-centered architecture, actually enables all three of these uh, editing workflows. You can do direct editing. And what I think is so interesting about this is, since your rules are encapsulated in those RESTful services, every client application is gonna follow your rules. You didn't really have that, per se, in the um, in old client server uh, style. Now, maybe you wanna deploy a simple web, apping, uh, web editing application to your customer service department and enable them to change a meter attribute or to move a meter. You can do that uh, with the assurance that all the edits they make are actually gonna be you know, um, following your rules. But of course, versioning has a place. Uh, you know, Versioning is super useful for design, uh, being able to have that kind of walled garden of your designs that's sitting off to the side, so to speak, uh, but it's still in the same enterprise system. And then, you know, there are going to be organizations that still want to use that version with that extra step of, of posting the version from a supervisor uh, or, or another editor. And I think the key is that RTF supports all three simultaneously. So you can leverage the, the workflow that makes sense for your use case. John? No, this, this is really good. Um, actually, one of the things that I've started to hear more frequently uh, is that often utilities are looking to do those direct edits right against default. Um, and, and it really comes to, to highlight the things that you mentioned earlier, Chris, uh, in regards to really what the rule base brings to the table um, and uh, you know how, how it can kind of keep the data uh, nice and clean uh, to meet the business needs. Yeah, John, I mean, in today's world, everybody wants to uh, enable uh a data-driven organization so that people are making better, more informed decisions at the speed of business, you know, so to speak. Um, quicker and faster. Exactly, and I think that, you know, you, you would expect that kind of direct uh, edit. And that's, you know, frankly, what you see in a CRM system or an ERP is that ability to, to really see information as it's changed so that reporting and other systems are, are synchronized uh, with the, the latest and and most authoritative information. So again, when you move into that 
third POC to, you know, or however you've defined it, uh, you can really experiment with these workflows and see, you know, what's what and how to best apply these. So hopefully, you know, what John and I were able to do was to help you, if nothing else, launch your personal POC today. Because um, I think I think you all know this, ArcGIS provides a really comprehensive network management uh, solution because it's such a rich and, and broad set of capabilities. And with the utility network, you know, the, it's just a purpose built for, for utility asset and network management. Those robust security and business rules, you know, apply to all your users, apps and integrations. I think that's, that's really gonna have an impact on your, by lowering your total cost of ownership and making it easier, frankly, for you to, to administer a system that gets broadly used across an organization. Um, it opens up the ability to view and edit data from mobile, web, and desktop applications alike. You know, the web services are going to work uh, across the whole gamut of your application portfolio. I think that's that's really important. You know, the John brought this up. Um, I think Matt touched on it a bit too. Is you know, improving the quality, consistency, and completeness of your asset data is something you're going to achieve uh, by moving over into using this utility network information model and the associated capabilities of ArcGIS. And boy, I'll tell you, last but not least, I'm really glad we mentioned the foundation templates because I think those can accelerate your efforts. John, anything final before we turn it back to Matt? No, that's, uh, I think, a, a great wrap up. Uh, I know we're uh, getting close to the completion of the time. Uh, and I think there's uh, one or two questions out there that, uh, you know, if we've got time, would uh, you know, the audience would probably like for us to address. Okay. So Matt, how about we pack it back to you and you take us through that? Yeah, well, well, thanks, Chris and John. Um, we started this webinar with the intent to help our customers, you know, better understand what the utility network is and why it's such a transformational technology that really goes beyond, you know, your traditional GIS putting lines and dots on a map. And I think you have both done a fantastic job um, in clarifying this. And I think that this has given our audience a better perspective on how this technology is actually architected to work. But I think you clarify that this technology is also available today. Uh, and this is available for electric, gas, water, and telecom. And we already have many customers that have already successfully moved to production. But I think perhaps most importantly, um, that this is something that is actually can be set up very easily. It can be low effort and quick to deploy approaches are actually available to get our customers started and underway in deploying their utility network, uh, which ultimately helps them realize you know, their organizational goals um, to you know, moving towards a modern geospatial strategy and a modern GIS platform. So, so thank you both for that. Um, I wanna take a moment to remind everybody that the next webinar is on the 22nd of July, and this one will focus on the business value of the ArcGIS Utility Network. So a lot of people are asking for demonstrations in the questions and examples. This webinar is where we'll be showcasing a lot of the capabilities and how they apply to workflows and how you know how we can actually use this technology to solve your business challenges. So the next webinar will, will definitely encapsulate a lot of those demonstrations and showcase the capabilities across all the different industries. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I also just want to remind everybody on the call um, that our Largest GIS community event, the Esri User Conference, is just days away. It starts on Monday, the 13th of July. So this is the first time that this conference is going virtual. And we're very excited um, to say that we have over 51,000 people registered, which is by far the world's largest GIS conference in the world. And it really is going to be something special. Um, on the screen here, I've included a number of utility uh, network focused um, demonstrations and technical sessions. These will be live and there'll be an opportunity to have a Q&A at the end of those. So if we've whet your appetite with this webinar today, be sure to, to register. It's complimentary for everyone that's on our GS um, um, subscription. Please register, please attend these sessions, um, ask any questions you have. All of the utility team, the subject matter experts will be available and on hand. Uh, we also have you know, over 150 partners um, and sponsors that are coming. And we have a lot of really great partners that have completed our Utility Network Specialty Program. They'll be available and they can also help you uh, with either implementation services or solutions. Uh, we also have a number of 
Um, other options um, where you can engage with our team, we have a utility network dedicated virtual room available. So this is where a lot of our subject matter experts will be during the expo showcase hours. So you can reach out, come into that room and engage directly with people like John Long and Chris who, you've, who have been presenting today. So don't miss out on that. Um, now, if we move forward, we have actually run very short on, on time for questions. We have had pages of questions. But John, just just very quickly, a couple I think that you can you can get through. Um, if we can just say, is utility network an extension of the ArcGIS? Is is one of the questions we had through. Can can you cover that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll hit that one first. Uh, so while the utility network uh, isn't new, it it actually uh, was released at the 10.6 release, uh, and it was at that point in time a server side extension. Uh, so it was an extension to ArcGIS Enterprise at, at that point in time. Uh, at the 10.8 uh, the release, it moved to a user type extension. Uh, so uh, basically uh, a slight transition on uh, how the actual software gets licensed between those releases. Excellent. We do, we do have a lot of people requesting the slides. Um, we'll definitely make them available. We'll PDF them um, and the recording will be we sent out by email. Uh, one final question, um, it probably is a tee up to webinar three, but are migration tools available for moving from geometric network to utility network? Yes, um, we've got uh, migration tools in various forms. Uh, you know, we've got a simple append, uh, which uh, allows you to just append your data into a, uh, either an asset package or, or really the utility network. Um, we also have uh, something that our solutions team developed called the data loading tools. Uh, which uh, really are a quick way to map your source data to really the target uh, information model uh, and, and kind of uh, you know migrate that data over. And then we've got more advanced tools uh, that are available uh, through the data interoperability extension. And then last but not least, uh, we've got many business partners who have also developed migration tools as well. Excellent. Right, so we have we have run out of time. Um, all the other questions, we will get our technical team to respond, and we'll get the responses back to everyone that asked them. So we just move on to the next slide. I just want to thank our presenters again, um, John and Chris. You did a fantastic job. And if you want to reach out to them directly, um, I've provided their emails um, and their LinkedIn profiles here. I'd also like to thank everybody for joining, um, and I look forward to joining you again at UC, and then again on the webinar two on July 22nd. So thank you very much and have a great day.